four, three, two. Yes. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. friends and welcome back to another installment of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger, a professional artist and educator attempting to bring you the best in art historical content. As always, I appreciate the likes, shares, subscribes, comments, so please interact with the video. When you're pure, when you, your, your words are pure, people take them right in. They come right in. Over the past couple years, I feel like I change studios so often. I feel like Joe Rogan or something. Do we really want to connect ourselves? But I digress. So today, I want to talk a little bit about an artist who has influenced and impacted artists and styles of art from multiple... Uh, multiple facets of the time that he was alive, and that's an artist by the name of Edouard Manet. Again, one of the most famous and influential artists of the realistic era, without question, was Edouard Manet. As great as he was, he had a remarkably short career as an artist, only working professionally for 23 years. With the old beard, I look a little Manet, I think. Maybe not. His story begins, in all places, Paris, France. He was born there, his father was a Parisian judge, and when he got to the age of being able to select a career path, good old daddy was not too keen on him pursuing a career in the arts. Who the f*** got you in charge? So young Manet looked to join the Navy. His first assignment was to work on a transport ship that set out for Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. After about seven months at sea, his father would agree to let him study art because he was clearly not cut out for a military career path. His official training began under academic and copyist Thomas Culture. He worked under him for six years that seemed to be somewhat grueling to Manet. He was longing for adventure, and he begins to travel Europe, seeking out the established artists of the day. Individuals that he met with would include Eugène Delacroix and Charles Baldasser, and he would set the groundwork for establishing himself in an art studio in the ranks of the professionals. There's work to be done. There's things you have to do in order to, to be this person that, that people admire. And it doesn't come easy. During his travels, he was very influenced by the artworks that he came across, especially those found in Spain. He truly loved the artwork of Diego Velázquez, saying, He is the greatest artist of all. And at this point, Velázquez was considered a painting legend. But there were other regional artists that he would grow to have great respect for, that were far less known in Manet's day. Artists like El Greco and Francisco de Goya were less popular in the mid-1800s, but he grew to respect their artwork, and they would become giants in the ranks of the art establishment. Eventually, he would have nine works accepted into the government-sponsored salon, as well as being awarded an honorable mention during his very short career, were huge accomplishments to Manet. He was always interested in keeping his art original and mixing up the styles and techniques all the time. They force you mm -hmm. into this school, mm -hmm. you don't want to learn, mm -hmm. but then when you get out and you realize like, oh, this actually benefits me. This is making me a better person. This is making me wiser. One thing that remained consistent about him was his drive to paint the human figure. He seemed to refuse to accept the idea that you could paint from your mind. He wanted to paint from a live model. However, these models were oftentimes a source of stress. Along that vein, Monet was generating an idea that would follow up a pretty good showing at the salon the previous year. Now, you can't get too far in talking about Manet without talking about luncheon on the grass. It's fucking great. This work would require three primary figures. He lined up for his favorite model. Victorin Morent was the primary character in the painting. Other models would include his younger brother, Gustave, and his fiancé's brother, Rodolphe Lienhoff. 
When he would submit the work in the 1863 Salon, he called the work the bath. This work, one of his most recognized works, and without question one of the most recognized artworks in all of art history, was rejected from the Salon. The art critics absolutely hated it. Why in that time did they hate the work? Well, people saw it as vulgar and indecent. The general rule of showing a nude body was the subject must be a classical study, meaning it was rooted in Greek or Roman mythologies, or showing an allegory that was intended to teach a life lesson. Even though Manet was referencing a Renaissance-like theme, it was not a painting of a goddess or a myth. Manet was painting a modern girl in a modern setting. We see the model gazing over her shoulder at us. And as viewers of the painting, we are voyeurs that see this defiantly nude woman looking at us in a blunt sort of way. She's very, very nice. Mm. A nude with completely dressed modern men. This was outrageous. This was the first time that a prominent artist would publicly display any female figure in this sort of context. Technically, the critics tore it apart. It had a lack of shadows from the trees above, and this removal of shadows was likely borrowed from the popular images that he was studying from Japanese prints that were very popular at this time. Also, because Manet could not replicate the light filtered through those trees in his studio, he simply painted it with a spotlight on the central figure. We look past the nudes and the lighting and get to our final question. What is this about? Just give me your take on it. Picnics and prostitutes. That's the way people rolled in 1860s Paris. Well, as it turns out, a lot of artwork was rejected in 1863. A relatively good number of artists got together and asked Napoleon III for permission to host a second show that year because of the small number of works that were included in the official show. So he granted permission for this second show to take place, a show called the Salon des Refusés. This show of refused art gave Manet a showcase to display this work in public. But ironically, the public hated it just as much as the critics hated it. But on the positive side, artists absolutely loved it. Manet would make a lot of connections through this experience and through those artists that were drawn to him after viewing his luncheon on the grass. And that would make him a major influencer on the core of what would become the Impressionist art movement. Like, what are you, are you doing this because you think this? Or are you doing this because you think it'll make people think more highly of you if you do it? After this exhibition with the Salon des Refusés, Manet would marry Suzanne Lienhoff on October the 28th in Holland. At this time, it was a little bit odd that this handsome young bachelor would commit to an older woman with an illegitimate son. Strangely, the pair met when she was giving him piano lessons. They had lived together for about three years before deciding to get married. Manet, who was very close with his parents, had a tough time moving away from his mom. So, in 1866, this new little family of three moved in with his mom after his dad had passed away. From a financial point of view, keeping in mind that his family was very wealthy, living at home with his mom was a pretty good setup for Manet. You'd be f***ing yeah. You would be f yeah. You would never be able to do it. It would be interesting to know what Susanna's real thoughts were on this whole setup, but alas, we'll never really know that. At any rate, Manet would leave the house for his various activities in town, visit studios, and hang out in the cafes with his time, leaving his new bride at home with his mom. I'm sure living was very smooth, <laughs> but I digress. Although he had those failures to get into the salon in 1863, he had a very successful attempt in 1864. But this work would cause no less of an outrage in the art community. This work was very much inspired by the Renaissance artist Titian and his work The Venus of Urbano, again using his favorite model, Victorin. But this time she was playing the role of Olympia. 
As he worked on the painting, even though he wanted to kind of keep the background dark, he made a conscious effort to have it contain no straight black pigments. He was known for saying that black is not a color, and it must always be mixed with other colors to give it a more realistic look on the canvas. We can also pick up that there are no hard contour lines around the images in the artwork. He would create these lines and planes of color by butting them up next to one another and creating layers of paint. While on display at the salon, the work did get some negative critiques because of its content. It was very hard for people to get past the nude thing. And Manet was a very sensitive guy, but he tried to get his mind off of it and, and not really focus on that harsh criticism in his viewpoint. Having said, I paint what I see and not what others like to see. He puts a fucking halt to that. Manet would create another very influential artwork in 1866. Here, what do I know? I color for a living, but I know that this painting really changed the art scene. The Fife Player was a work that took inspiration from his travels throughout Europe. We can see hints of Diego Velasquez, Francisco de Goya, Franz Halls, and the very popular Japanese art styles of printing from back in the day. The flattening of a picture floating in isolation is a very popular characteristic of imagery in Asian art at this time. This was a disregard for the rules of perspective that would cause this work to be rejected by the salon. At about the time that he was painting the Fife player, Manet was becoming very friendly with a group of young artists that were a little outrageous for the time. These new friends included artists like Paul Cezanne, Camilla Pizarro, Claude Monet, Edgar Degas, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, Alfred Sisley, and Bertha Morissat. And they, you know, they were coming for him. They liked to hang out at the Café Garbois, where they would speak about art that focused on truly seeing the colors of the world. Manet had a slightly different approach because he was focused on painting people rather than purely painting nature. As the group would become more tight-knit, Manet would become greatly respected by the group, and his friends very much viewed him as an elegant and charming man. With his cunning wit, he was not above speaking out against someone who agitated him. For example, there was one February night in 1870 where Manet got into a very heated exchange with a colleague that was a regular at the Café Garbois. A prolific French novelist and art critic, Louis Edmond Duranti. Manet was very insulted by a review that he had written and ended up getting into a duel with him out in the street in front of the cafe. What are you doing? You can't assault people. Although Manet did get the better of him in the duel, his opponent was not fatally wounded and the two actually remained friends. He is also a man that battled depression and anxiety throughout his life. When the Franco-Prussian War broke out in 1870, Manet became a very patriotic person, and with the rank of staff lieutenant, he served in the National Guard as a gunner and later fought in the cavalry for the French army. His studio was practically destroyed in the war, but he thought ahead enough to safely store his artworks away so they were not destroyed as well. Almost all of these works were bought by art dealer Paul Durant Ruel, who I spoke about in the video on Impressionist artworks created previously. But to get back on track with Manet, many people get confused with Manet because they assume that because his friends were the Impressionists, he must have been an Impressionist himself. Although there was mutual respect, Manet's style and working methods were not at all like the Impressionists. Without question, his artwork would influence the Impressionist painters, but he turned down an offer to exhibit with them in their first exhibition in 1874, as he had to keep true to himself and his way of working. By 1882, his health began to drastically decline. His last truly great work was a bar at the Folies Bergère. For the ninth and final time, his artwork was accepted into the official salon in Paris. 
A question that many have about Manet is what is his process and can we use that to improve our work? What he said was this, get it down quickly. Don't worry about the background. Just go for the tonal values. When you look at the whole thing, you don't need to try to count the scales on the salmon. Of course not. You see them as little silver pearls against gray and pink, isn't that right? Look at the pink of the salmon, with the bones appearing white in the center, and then grays like the shades of mother of pearl. The folds will come by themselves if you put them in their proper place. Ah, Mr. Arngs, there's the man. We're all just children. There's the one who knew how to paint materials. Above all, keep your colors fresh. What a friendly guy. The following year, he would have his left leg amputated because it was infected with gangrene. Eleven days later, he would pass away from untreated syphilis. Manet's name became more popular after his death because of the venues that exhibited his art became more prestigious. The more his art was exhibited, the more people enjoyed it, and the more galleries and museums that wanted to show it and own the works. The interesting fact of the matter is that his finished works are in the minority. Of the 430 known and cataloged paintings, about two-thirds are copies, sketches, or unfinished, and thus making them unexhibitable artworks. And ten years after his death, Olympia was finally bought and accepted into the Louvre after his friend Claude Monet headed a fundraising effort to prevent it from being sold to an American buyer. As Monet was very much opposed to selling any artworks to the barbaric Americans that he despised. In general, the people that say that suck. Tell you what, I love that story. And if you like it too, please give me a thumbs up. What's wrong with going on stage or going on camera with someone that you oppose?